Welcome everyone to another episode of the Shaman's Way podcast. As always, this episode comes from the teachings of our amazing friend and shaman in residence, Cricket. We hope you're enjoying these podcasts as much as we enjoy making them, and I'd like to take just a moment to ask you if you would please leave us a rating and a comment in iTunes or whichever podcast player you're listening to us from. Giving us a rating and sharing this podcast with others is the biggest way you can tell us that you like our show. Now, without further ado, on with the episode. Hello, my constant listener. I wanted to touch on the subject of grief, or the emotion of grief, the psyche of grief. One of the reasons I'm inspired is because a lovely friend, Nikki Featherstone, and I are doing a women's workshop called Women Rising, Awakening the Storm, July 13th to the 15th, 2018, just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. We are honoring grief, and we are honoring the ability to scream, to shout, to keen, lament, to moan. We're bringing in the element of air so air can clear out the space to finally let the pain that we embody from a life lived as a woman in a system set against us. Grief is the wounding that not only we share, but our sisters share, our daughters, our mothers, our grandmothers, and our aunts. In North America, we don't have a intact culture, at least not in the Caucasian culture, much of the uh, non-tribal, non-group reality. We don't have a sacred communal space for the pain that is held, processed, grieved, or transformed. We don't have wakes. Uh, We don't have, like, I don't have a wake in my culture history, in my family history. Uh, I don't have a history of a feast. I have a history of having uh, really bad sandwiches and shitty coffee after a funeral. Uh, I have a history in my family of not speaking about a person or an issue or something that has died. And died doesn't just mean human being. How do we process this? How do we hold this? How do we transform this? That is the intention of the weekend that we're doing, the woman rising, awakening the storm We are working with Raven, and I dedicated the previous two podcasts to Raven to talk about my relationship with Raven and also to bring in some understanding of how Raven is a psychopomp being, how Raven not only is the trickster in some cultures, Raven is an alchemist, is a uh, one who changes and moves things. The work around grief that we're doing is we're bringing our own pain, our grief, our wounds, our moans, our loneliness, our abandonment, and we're bringing it to the healing ground. We're creating a sacred space for this. And this is in the tradition of, you know, women holding space for women, humans holding space for humans. The awakening, the storm is in that relationship to grief, we often know that the only way out is through. And we are holding and honoring that pain, the grief, isolation, disconnection. And we are coming together as a group of women and we rise together and we awaken the storm of change within us. As I talked about in the, you know, fact, not fiction aspect of Raven, Raven is a bird that loves to soar above the currents, among other birds. But Raven also has that sense of play or that sense of adventure to explore how the currents feel in this dive or that's in that 
aerial formation or in that aerial formation. So using the relationship with Raven helps us to move amongst the currents in a way that might not necessarily occur to many people. So instead of rising just above the currents and soaring above the currents, we're asking, you know, I'm asking Raven to help me to move amongst the currents and heck, maybe even have some fun as I learn my own way, my own peace. The opposite of war is not peace, it is creation. How we choose to experience the change in our life, it really is up to us. To a certain extent, let's be honest. I mean, there are personality issues, there are mental health issues, there are cognitive issues, there are a whole lot of other things. To say it as simplistically as that, I do not wish to come across as being absolutely arrogant to say, you know, we all can do X, Y, Z because some of us, you know, have different skills in DEF where I might have a skill in ZQR. You know, we all have these different relationships. What I want to get back to before I lose my train of thought, because sometimes I do lose a train of thought, the retreat is has rituals and ceremonies. The Nikki is an amazing art therapist and leads the gathering in ways of transforming your grief, recognizing your grief in some form of creation. My job is often to bring about the the skeletal structure of the ritual and the skeletal structure of the the involvement of the psyche within the context of the creational relationship of grief. So whether it is an an art form of clay, whether it is a painting, whether it is a mask, we've done various things over the years. We have that, we have ceremonies, we will, you know, we have yoga, we have bonfires, drumming and dancing, Uh, So it is a a great opportunity to explore what this is. And if you would like to know more or if you would like to register, then you can send an email through my website, Shaman's Way, or you can send a message to Nikki Featherstone at ourhaven.ca and she will help you work through this. And I'll make some references on the Shaman's Way website for this workshop. And now I want to discuss and go a little bit further in my own relationship to grief and what grief is and what grief means. Grief is a journey through many levels of pain. In my life, my story with my family was that we did not celebrate death. So we had Uh, horrible, you know, that horrible tang, that horrible fruit punch, really bad tasting coffee, and soggy sandwiches in the basement of the church or at someone's home after funerals in my family. We did not have a wake. We did not keen or sing our grief. We were not allowed expression of grief. I remember even at funerals, to, you know, a well-meaning aunt or grandmother telling me, shh, 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 there, there, don't cry, there, there, don't cry. I remember those. I remember not being able to discuss grief or the death of my sister and the loss of my brothers. We were not allowed to discuss those sorts of topics I don't know why to this day. My mother died April 9th, 
1992, so she is long gone. And my father is deeply into dementia and even further, more deeply into denial. And therefore, I don't believe he would have ever been a very good person to talk to, to find answers from. But grief is seen as the loss of a human being. But many times in soul retrieval work, I have encountered grief of many different kinds. One of the grieves, griefs, grievances, I'm not sure what the word would be, that I found buried in the soul is the grief of unseen or unfollowed through or not followed through projects or creations. We grieve the loss of ideas. How many ideas have we gestated and never born? And how many of those ideas do we lament and do we wish to do harm for? How many of us have grieved the loss of a relationship, whether it is through Alzheimer's, dementia, through drug addiction, through alcoholism, through disassociation, through mental illness? And have you had the opportunity to grieve the loss of that relationship? Have you able to grieve what that relationship could have looked like and what it actually looks like today? If your relationship with someone very close to you and very sacred to you has been marred by severe drug addiction, the fentanyl addiction that is going through the population, I, it is really a challenge to hold on to that vision of your son, your daughter, your father, your mother, your aunt, your uncle, whoever it is, your brother, whoever it is in your family that has fallen to addiction, how do you grieve the loss of what you think is and how do you live in the trauma of what the now is? That's a part of the process of grief. That is part of the process of the different faces of grief. We also grieve our thoughts. We grieve our not saying things. So now we're grieving the crown chakra. We are grieving the throat chakra. We are grieving the heart chakra. We are grieving the second chakra. We are grieving those aspects of ourselves which give us power. When we grieve what we did not say, what we did not say could be a positive or a negative. What we did not say could be, I wish I would have said to my mother before she died, I love you one more time. We could have grief over not being present during the death of a loved one. We could have grief over being an unsuspecting witness to the end of a person's life, whether through a motor vehicle accident, whether through a heart attack in front of you, whether through any number of various things. So we have the grief of our own impact, how we were impacted as an innocent bystander, not expecting to have the journey of someone's soul lost before your very eyes. Those are all types of different griefs. And how do we channel them? How do we embrace them? How do we create and make them? We also have grief within the psyche, and the psyche expresses and demonstrates that grief in different ways. Your dreams may manifest your grief. Your dreams may manifest your grief in ways such as never ever being able to get away from that which is chasing you. Not only could that be an anxiety dream, but that could also be a grief dream. If you do not have a safe outlet or natural outlet or any, any outlet at all, there is a very high chance that you 
may run this through your psyche over and over and over again because your soul and your consciousness wish to unburden but because we have you know we have a a blockage in the crown so how do we how do we into it how to release that how do we intellectually release that we have a block in the throat so that is an aspect of creativity so how do we creatively get around that we have a block in the heart so how are we supposed to pump emotions positive and negative through our body if we have a blockage So when we come back to the dream and we see the dreamer, yourself, myself, perpetually chased by the same thing or taken into a room where we have no escape from, could that be that never-ending escape from your grief or the never-ending inability to find escape for your grief? Grief can also come in the form of physical aches or heart aches. Many times when we are hurt, we literally have a pain in the heart. And the heart is one of the brains of the body as well. Doctors comment that we have three brains, the brain in the head, the brain in the heart, and the brain in the gut. The brain in the heart is a purveyor of the tastes of the emotions you go through. What does grief taste like? Is it bitter? Is it foul? Is it sweet? Do you like grief? Do you, are you a victim of grief? Do you play on the victim of grief? Does grief look different? If we look at it in the eye, can we see a color? If, can we see a color of blue? Can we see black? Do most of us just see black? What color is grief? And if we had to sit back and take a breath, so sit back and just go, and out, and another nice deep breath in, and exhale. And one more time for good measure. And with a soft gaze, if you can, or with a quiet eye, where is grief in your body? Where does it rest? Is it in your third chakra? Is it between your shoulder blades? Is it that dull ache behind your eyes? Is it the arthritis in your hands? Where does grief reside in your body? And how do you work with this energy in your body? I would recommend that you journey to that part of your body. Write it down. And if you don't write it down, if you have a super dancey phone like most of us do, maybe do a very short voice recording and be reminded that you found grief in X part of the body. Perhaps what you would like to do is you would like to draw a skeletal figure. And if you're really uncomfortable with drawing, You can go to the awesome Google search machine and you can find any type of image for yourself and print that image out. And I strongly recommend that you circle that part where grief is in your body. And if you weren't able to locate grief as a within the body, then ask if you are fully present in your body. And if there is no grief to find in your body, I'm not uh, attempting by any stretch of the imagination to say that your experience isn't real or isn't valid. If grief does not reside within your body, then where does it reside? Does it reside outside of your body? Is it disconnected and disassociated from you? If grief is not within the body or around the body, is grief completely disassociated? Is it so locked in the 
depths of the psyche, in the depths of the shadow, in the depths of the underworld that you no longer have access or even wish to have access to it or with it. These are some of the questions I would ask about grief. These are some of the questions that I would bring to myself about grief. And if you are able to locate it in the body and you do take it that next step and you are able to place it onto a form, a sheet of paper, a piece of art, are you able to associate a color with it? And if you can associate a color with it, can you draw that color? And if you draw that color, can you also draw a shape? You don't have to see it in your mind's eye. It's not some psychic thing. It's just whether or not you can draw a shape. And if you're too scared to do that, ask yourself why. Why wouldn't you draw a shape? And if you're too scared to put a color on it, is it so overwhelming that to put a color on it might open something you have no desire to open, express, experience, or feel? And if that is the case, then you, my constant listener, are the one who needs this exercise more than anyone else. We need to bring the unconscious and make it conscious. If we bring the unknown patterns into the known, then the unknown patterns have less effect on our unconscious behavior than we give them credit for. If we are comfortable within our body, we are freer than if we are uncomfortable in our body. One of the ways that we cope with grief or with trauma is to disassociate. We cope with grief and with trauma by getting over it, moving on, getting up. My experience with grief has never been getting on with it or getting over it ever. Whether it has been the grief of an idea, the grief of an idea is to know that I have that unfinished essay amongst the 700 and some odd essays on my computer and just let it be and maybe incorporate it into another idea or a bigger idea later on. Some concept of myself that I have to grieve, especially as I age, there are aspects of my youth that I must grieve, not because I'm not youthful or because I'm not vital or any of those things, but there are things that I could do more easily in a younger body than I can do in this body. And those sorts of things are resiliency, less wrinkles. So I grieve that face that looked back at me sometimes when I was 20, but I do not grieve the naive mind that came with the beautiful skin. I do not grieve my sharp creases between my eyebrows because I call those my what-the-fuck lines. And I do not grieve the bags under my eyes or the dark circles under my eyes sometimes because I know that my purpose in life sometimes requires a lot of energy. I do grieve my younger self who had more energy than I do now, that I do grieve. I do not grieve the idea of what my career was supposed to look like. I let go of who I was supposed to be and moved into what I am. And that has enabled me to create more peace within myself to examine. My friend Nikki would say in a matter of grief, to create art or to write, to get it out, to get it out. 
And I agree, because we are bringing the conscious into it. We can have many types of unconscious or abstract healings. If we do not have that transference piece or that piece that brings it into the world, often we can't get the conscious mind to buy in. So instead of thinking about, I have to get over this or get over that, I try to transform it. So I will leave that essay hanging, but I will probably incorporate it into other works that I've done, that I have done over the time already. I have bits and pieces of dreams that I have woven into suggestions and creative ideas for other humans who have crossed my path who seem better fit for those goals or those ideas than I did. Whether they're ever used or taken home is irrelevant. I build altars to the things I have lost. I put bones in the north for the ancestors that I have grieved. I put a burnt-out candle in the east for the life force that has been snuffed out because it never came to be. In south, I put ashes for the burnt life, for the end life. And in the west, I put murky water for the memories are long gone of the person who has died and I can no longer retrieve them as clearly as I could have. And in the center, I place stones of myself, and sometimes they're my Black River stones. Sometimes they're in five different stones for the mental, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, and the other. I recognize that my grief can take years to move through me, and I'm okay with that. I recognize that. One of the most profound healings I experienced in the spirit world was releasing my long-dead sister. And it was not a journey that I was expecting. It certainly wasn't the journey that was mapped out for that Friday night circle. However, the effect of having a ceremony to release that piece of her that was stuck and kept so sacredly, so deep within myself. I had to step down seven ladders, and each ladder representing one kiva. So going down into the depth of the deepest, darkest aspects of self And grandmothers were there in each of the directions. And what a beautiful prayer shroud and prayer cloths over her. And a great bear came forward. And the grandmothers lifted my sister's small body upon the great bear. And the great bear and I walked northwest until I was not allowed to go any further. And... The rest of the journey isn't really something to share. However, I wanted to let you know that there are gifts of transformation of healing. There are gifts of understanding healing. It isn't something that just happens. Grief is a process. Grief is a journey. Grief has so many faces. We need to recognize that we are amazingly resilient humans with tangible ideas that sometimes never move from the intangible to the tangible or from the abstract to the concrete. And we need to recognize that at times ideas we are given, thoughts and visions we are given, 
I also keep in mind that not all of them are mine. Some of the journeys, some of the visions, some of the ideas I have received over the years have been gifts and or leftover ideas and creations from the ancestors and the spirits who guide my journeys. I have also experienced grief. It was referenced to me one time like a brick in my pocket. And every day that I have to initially put the brick in my pocket, that brick is, is a weight, and I feel it every day when I put on my coat or on my cardigan or on my sweater. But over time, I become used to the weight and I no longer notice the weight until I put my hand in my pocket and I touch the brick and I'm reminded, oh, right, I have grief. Maybe you can put your hand in a different pocket. Maybe you can take a journey to that spot in your body that houses grief and speak to the spirit of grief that dwells within that spot in your body and ask grief what it needs from you in order to transform, to rise out of you, or to help you live with it in a manner that allows existence but not absolute interference or the complete dissolution of routine or self? How can we live with grief and still maintain our sense of humanity, maintain what makes us human? I think that is a valuable question. I think it is valuable to understand and to recognize that grief comes in many forms, not just the form of the loss of someone you love. Grief has many faces, and therefore there is absolutely no one way to release yourself from the grip of grief. As you would treat each friend differently, even if it's only minutely, you will treat your grieving aspects differently, even if only minutely. I ask that you pay attention to how you feel after you listen to my voice today. I ask you to pay attention to those dreams that you may have thought were just anxiety. I ask you to give yourself permission to recognize where grief rides within the body or outside of the body. I ask you to give yourself permission to understand that you can disassociate, but you also have the ability to associate and integrate. So do not believe that your safest way in this life is to dissociate from the emotions. The safest way in this life is to dive deep into the emotions, gather from them all that you can, to only again re-emerge. Those, my dear listener, are some of my ponderings and thoughts on grief and grieving. I bid you a fond farewell and I look forward to seeing you again, talking to you again very shortly. Be well. Thank you again for joining us here on the Shaman's Way podcast. If you have any questions, would like to make a request for a future episode, or if you're looking for other shamanic resources, including free drumming tracks, please visit us at shamansway.net. Until the next episode, be well, everyone.